Fabian of the Yard. Stories of the war against crime, as told by the detective of the century, ex-superintendent Robert Fabian. Here is another factual crime detection story drawn from the personal records of ex-detective Superintendent Fabian of Scotland Yard. Murderers considerably above average and cunning have many times tried one or two variety of schemes which sometimes come very close to succeeding in throwing suspicion either onto someone else or at least away from the real criminal. The first of these is usually the unpremeditated kind in which a body may be found in circumstances that are bafflingly simple, providing no clue to the motive or the identity of the killer. The other kind of murder is the faked accident. The victim may have apparently fallen from an upstairs window and broken his neck, or he may be found at the wheel of his car in an enclosed garage asphyxiated by exhaust fumes following a drinking orgy, or, as in this case, he might be presumed to have died in a garage fire while drunk. Fortunately, however, experienced police are rather sceptical about such apparent accidents, as you will observe when, in a moment, you hear the story of a criminal who committed murder to music. Since late evening at Saxton Grange, the stabled horses had been restless. As animals often will, they sensed something wrong in the garage next door. And suddenly, with a roar, a car in the garage exploded. Flames burst through the roof and reached tongues of fire out to the sky. Over at the house, the undergroom, Ernest Brown, hammered on the front door. Mrs. Morton! Mrs. Morton! The old place is on fire. Mrs. Morton! Mrs. Morton! Ernest, what is it? The garage. It's on fire. Look. Good heavens. Can you save the car? Oh, you can't get near the place. We'll try to save the horses and the horse box from the barn. I'll ring for help. Right. The phone's dead. I can't get any answer. Oh, what'll we do now? You'll have to drive the horse flat to Turton for help. Quick now, get there as fast as you can. Hey, Ernie, lad. How is it now up at the Grange since the fire? It was a terrible thing, young Mr. Morton, being killed and all. Oh, it is that. I feel fair sick about it all. Give us a pint, will you, Joel? I need someone to book me up. Right, oh, Ernie. Coming right up. They tell me your boss had got himself drunk and was sitting in his car when the fire broke out. Is that a fact? Ah, it is that. I was always afraid that boss would get himself killed in that car. And through drink, too. Aye. And he was a hard-drinking man, too, was Freddie Morton. It's a great pity he had to go so young. Drink's a good thing when you can hold it, I always say. And I'm not one to talk against Mr. Morton, him being good for me bar trade, like. But them as can't hold it shouldn't take it. Ah, still it's hard on young missus. And her with a little baby, too. A fair makes a man feel sick, so it does. That was the feeling of most of the local people in the Yorkshire village, for 28-year-old Freddie Morton had always been popular. It was obvious to everyone that his death in the garage fire had been nothing more than a tragic accident. The local policeman went to the burnt-out ruins of the garage to poke around and make his formal report. But Constable Broadhead had to make an attempt to establish with scientific evidence that Morton had in fact been in the car throughout the fire. From the blackened ruins, he picked out some melted coins, a few keys belonging to Morton, and a two-carat diamond that had once adorned a ring belonging to the dead man. To his superior, Chief Superintendent Blacker at Wakefield headquarters, the constable reported that there was no doubt 
that it had been Frederick Morton, squire of Saxton Grange, who had died in the garage fire. I want to take a trip up to Saxton Grange, Sergeant. I think you'd better come with me. All right, sir. What's the story? I've just been looking over the file of this case with a report from Constable Broadhead about the death of Frederick Morton. Oh, yes. His accidental death in a garage fire. Yes, so the local people seem to think. And I, I'm not happy about it. The statement made by the groom, Ernest Brown, for instance. He said... The boss came in about half past eleven that night, roaring drunk. He said he'd come for some petrol and was going straight out again. He did, too. I went to bed. It must have been half past three in the morning when I heard the horses and saw the fire. And now, look at this statement by the man's wife. I had been working in the kitchen with my maid until midnight. We were simmering jam. We both heard my husband's car come in at about half past eleven. We didn't hear him drive out again. But he did not enter the house. Yes, yes I see what you mean, sir. It's hard to reconcile those two statements. Oh, it's quite so. And on top of that, the assessor for the insurance company reported that the petrol tanks of the car had not exploded. But the tank caps were still on. But both the drain taps were open, allowing the contents of the tanks to drain onto the floor. There might be something fishy about that, sir. When do we leave? Right away. Order the car, will you? Yes, sir. <laughs> You're Ernest Brown, are you? The groom from Saxton's Grange? That's right, sir. Bad business, this, Brown. Aye, sir, it is that. They tell me uh, you were in the yard when Mr. Morton came in. Aye. You saw him go out again? Aye, sir, that I did. Whilst he was talking to Brown, the superintendent was summing up the character of the man. The groom was obviously something of a ladies' man, smartly dressed in a brown suit with neat shirt and tie and well-cut breeches. Meanwhile, the superintendent's assistant had been interviewing Mrs. Morton's maid. Well, the maid seems quite an intelligent sort of girl, sir. She was very clear about this matter of the phone going out of order. Oh. What did she have to say? Well, a call came from Mr. Morton at about quarter to ten that night. It was very important, apparently, and the caller said he'd ring back in about 15 minutes. Oh. Yes. Uh, Morton, of course, was out at that time. That's right, sir. The maid says the second call never came. So perhaps the phone went out of order between 9.45 and 10 o'clock. Hmm. Where was Brown when the phone rang, do you know? He was in the kitchen. The maid says he later went outside and took with him a knife. This one. Very interesting. All right. I have the body sent to the county pathologist, Sergeant. Yes, sir. And get the GPO engineers to search Saxton Grange telephone wires for the spot where they've been deliberately cut. Do you think they were cut with the knife, sir? I do. I want you to send this knife and the cut ends of the telephone wire to Professor Trihorn at Hull University. Right, sir. The superintendent, of course, was playing a very shrewd hunch. And the GPO engineers found he was right about the first part of it. The Sexton Grange telephone wire had indeed been cut. And the sergeant had the cut ends of the wire dispatched immediately with the kitchen knife to Professor Trihorn. Whilst they waited for a report... The sergeant interviewed the landlord of the Boot and Shoe Inn at Peckfield. Uh, Mr. Morton was in the hotel on the night he died. Is that correct? I was and all. For that matter, Mr. Morton was here most nights. He was a hard drinking man, you know, sergeant. I see. Your statement you made earlier mentioned that Mr. Morton left the hotel at quarter to ten. Was he drunk or sober at that time? Well, funny you should mention that. As a matter of fact, he was stone cold sober that night. And we were talking business, and probably that's why he didn't drink too much. Did he say where he was going when he left? No, he did. He said he was going straight home. So he should have been home by ten o'clock. The report came to the superintendent from the county pathologist. He had found two shotgun pellets close to the heart in the charred remains of Morton's body. This was followed by the report on the telephone wires from Professor Trihorn at Hull. Well, here we are, Sergeant. I was right about the phone wires. The professor is quite certain that they were cut by this knife after examining the knife and the wires under a microscope. Good Lord. But do you think a court will accept that, sir? I don't recall any such evidence having been given before. Oh, uh, nor do I. But the professor's a good man, and he's absolutely certain about this. I'm willing to accept his report. Uh, get Mrs. Morton in here, will you? Yes, sir. 
You wanted to see me, Superintendent? Yes, Mrs. Horton. I'm sorry to have to say this, but... I think Ernest Brown murdered your husband. Mrs. Morton turned deadly pale, but didn't answer. Then, for a long time, the superintendent sat and waited, watching the woman while she paced the room and smoked several cigarettes, stubbing them before they were half finished. Finally, she turned to him and said, Ernest was in love with me, superintendent. He thought I loved him, but I didn't. He was jealous of my husband. So at approximately ten o'clock that night, when he knew that your husband was due home, he waited for him and killed him with a shotgun. Later, having cut the telephone wires, he set fire to the garage. I... I don't know. It's all too horrible. I still can't see how Ernest could have fired a gun without my maid and me hearing it in the kitchen. And we certainly didn't hear my husband drive in at ten o'clock. You have a radio receiver in your kitchen, Mrs. Morton. And your maid has told us that it was playing at that time. Was it? I don't remember. It was. Moreover, Ernest Brown turned it up to play very loudly before he left the kitchen with the knife he used to cut the telephone wires. The radio was still playing loudly a few minutes later when your husband drove the car in and was killed. That's why you didn't hear the car or the gunshot. So the case was complete. The scientific facts together with the established information that Brown had quarreled with his employer, Morton, and on one occasion had been dismissed by him, served to convict the groom of murder. In December 1933, the groom was convicted and later hanged. In a moment, you will hear from ex-superintendent Fabian a footnote to Murder to Music. And here is Mr. Fabian's footnote. Well, that is probably one of the first occasions on which a murderer had drowned the sound effects associated with his crime by playing a radio very loudly, but it certainly wasn't the last. Incidentally, Superintendent Blacker made a simple though extremely pregnant comment when friends asked him after the trial... What made him suspect murder in his apparently straightforward case of accidental death? He said, it's a policeman's job to suspect murder. He was quite right, of course, for like the scientist who is prepared to query everything, a policeman must always assume the possibility of foul play until the facts prove otherwise. My story next week will deal with a man who, like a lot of other people, fancied he would make some easy money on a racetrack. A case of two above the odds. 